Welcome back for another episode of Code Club. I'm your host, Pat Schloss, and I'm leading you through a series of episodes where we do a reproducible data analysis. In the last episode, we started doing an exploratory data analysis using R. We did that in a file called an R script, and we know it's an R script because the extension is .R. As we discuss at the end of that episode, we're going to be developing that analysis further to look at different taxonomic levels and to loosen our definition of what we mean by an amplicon sequence variant. By the way, if this is all gibberish to you, don't worry, there's a lot of value if you stick around. But what we saw with that R script was that there wasn't an easy way to record the results in the script. We could copy and paste the output from the R console to the R script and then insert a series of comments. But that really gets kludgy um, as, the, as, the, as the code develops and as it changes, and it really doesn't lend itself very well to incorporating figures. Alternatively, we could also create a Word or Google Doc file that integrates our code and figures as well as a narrative to describe uh, what's going on. I've done that as well. But if I want to change an upstream parameter or an upstream data file, I'll have to edit the document and make sure I've updated everything that has changed upstream. Again, this just gets really kludgy and cumbersome. So we need a better solution to these. Uh, and so there's a, there's a tool that's been created in the last few years called R Markdown. It's gotten a lot of support from R Studio, and it's been really well developed. In earlier episodes, we've talked about Markdown, which allows us to indicate things like bold, italics, headings, and so forth, using light formatting within a text file. Obviously, we've also talked about writing R code to do our analysis. R Markdown allows us to take the text and the code and marry them together along obviously with the output. We can use R to do the coding, or we can really use any other language. Uh, I'm gonna focus on using R because I know R, uh, but you could also use Python, you could use Bash, you can use other languages. So using the R Markdown package, we can use, we can use R to... <laughs> using the R Markdown package, we can use R to render an R Markdown file denoted by the extension rmd, to generate a markdown file, an HTML or web file, a Word file, or even a PDF. And there's a lot we can do with these R markdown files. In the past, I've used it to create better readme files, as we'll do in today's episode, to document our data analysis, kind of like a series of blog posts about our ongoing data analysis, uh, to create websites. If you've looked at my Riffamonas website, that's some of the tutorials on there, all of those tutorials were written in R Markdown, so the output that you see is generated by the code in the, in the, in the tutorial. I've also created entire slide decks for semester-long courses, and over the last few years, my lab has used it to generate our manuscripts. So we've already talked about using Markdown. In this and future episodes, we'll see how we can use R Markdown to make increasingly sophisticated documents like a manuscript. But we need to start slow. So today we'll make a better readme file and we'll also rewrite our R script from the last episode to be an R markdown document that describes what's happening in the code as well as reveals the output of the code. By the end of today's episode, I hope that you understand the difference between what a code chunk is and what inline code is and why we might want to use one over the other. We'll also see how to generate markdown and HTML files as output from our R markdown files. Finally, We'll learn how to tell R where to put the output file. Specifically, we will want it in our exploratory directory. So there are actually two issues that we're going to file and solve today. Uh, the first issue is I want to uh, update my R, my readme MD file to reflect uh, what I'm using on my computer. So I'd like to replace the version numbers of my R packages uh, with, um, uh, with R code so that the version numbers are dynamic, right? What we'll see is that if I update, say, the tidyverse package, uh, it will automatically update the version number for the tidyverse uh, in my readme file. So that's one thing that you can put in these little check boxes. Uh, and then also what I want to do is to output um, session info. I believe I showed this in the last episode or perhaps a previous episode uh, to show what packages 
and versions I have running on my version of R. Okay, we preview that to make sure it looks good. We're great. So we'll submit that new issue. The other new issue that I want to do is I want to convert my R script from 2020-0909 to a R markdown document. What I'd like to do is add narrative to my R script and generate a markdown version of the document that I can read on GitHub. Okay. So this might not make sense right now, or you may not know how we're going to do it, but this is what we're going to work on for today's episode. All right. So again, returning to the issues, we're going to open up a branch for issue 21, git branch issue 21, git checkout issue 21, and we're on branch issue 21. Returning to RStudio, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up into the left corner and you'll see under that white file, white square with the green uh, circle and white plus sign uh, to create a new R Markdown document. And for now, I'm going to leave all the defaults here. I will be updating this as we go along here. So you don't actually have to do uh, these steps to create a new R Markdown file. RStudio has some bells and whistles to make things easier. What I'm going to do then is open up my readme.md file that you'll see down here in the bottom right corner. This is my title uh, for my project and also that the title that I want to be including in here in my um, our markdown document. I'm the author. This date is good. This is the date that I'm, um, I'm recording this video on. I think it'll come out on the 14th on Monday. And I'm going to go ahead and delete all this other code. We'll talk about many of these things as we go along today. And I'm going to go to my readme file. And I will then highlight all this text and copy it and paste it into my untitled one file, which I need to save. And I'm going to save this as readme.rmd. RMD is the extension people use for our markdown documents. I'll save that. Now, uh, this basically has the same information that was here in my readme.md file. I'll go ahead and close the MD file for now. And what I can do um, is I can click knit. And when I click knit, by default, it's going to generate as output an HTML document. So I'll click knit. And you'll see the output has my title. And if I make the screen a little bit bigger, my name, the date, uh, and a variety of different bits of information that were all in my readme file, okay. which is excellent. So one problem with this is that um, HTML is great because it's viewable on the web. But if I put a HTML file onto GitHub, um, it's going to render it as HTML code, not the output of HTML. So instead, what I'd like to do is render it as markdown. And so what I can do, instead of HTML document, what I can do is GitHub document. And if I save that and knit, it will actually generate the GitHub document as well as a preview here in HTML. And in fact, if I look down here in my lower right corner and I kind of sort these by the date modified, I'll see that I've generated um, an R markdown file and, um, and an MD file. Um, I thought it should have produced the HTML file, but it doesn't seem to be producing that um, as the preview. So um, maybe we'll see that pop up later. Anyway, uh, so now this is outputting it as a markdown file, which then wrote over our previous markdown file. All right. So, so far we haven't really gained over anything over our kind of markdown file that we previously had been working with. Down at the bottom here, I'm going to create a new heading, and I will call this uh, my computer. And in here, I'm going to create what's called a code chunk. So in this readme file is a bunch of text, right? It's all text. There's no code. But if I wanted to put in put a chunk of code in here to produce output, I can do that with three back ticks. And the back tick is the key above the tab on your keyboard. 
It's on the same key as the tilde. And then I can do the curly braces. And inside of that, I can put R. And then I can close the code chunk with another set of three backticks. I can then do session info as a function and put the R code into this code chunk, right? If I run this, save it and knit it, and then scroll to the bottom, I will see that it generated, ran the command session info, and it inserted the output of running session info on my computer, right? And that way then if it's in the readme and you're wondering what all I have or what operating system I'm using or what version of R I'm using, um, it's here in this output from session info. Now, something I noticed that's not in here are uh, the tidyverse, right? And so uh, these are packages that we know that we've already used because we have them listed here in our dependencies. What I could do is up here, I could say library tidyverse and library data.table. And obviously I'm using library um, R markdown. Uh, so one of the nice things that our studio does is that it automatically runs library R markdown for you and it comes installed with it for you. Uh, it, it installs it for you. So if I click knit again, I will see down here at the bottom that it ran the library tidyverse and then it gave us all that output that it normally gives us. Again, for library data table and then it runs uh, library R markdown. And then what you'll see down here are additional packages that have been loaded. So now we see data table and we see tidyverse along with all the packages that are part of the tidyverse. Now, I'm not such a big fan of all this output being spat out to my document. And what we can do inside of this curly brace with the R is put a comma and then do messages message equals false. And what that will do is that that will tell our markdown, don't output any messages that come to the screen. If I again knit that and scroll down here, what you'll see is all that information about conflicts and whatnot from tidyverse and data.table are gone and that they are now, um, it's much cleaner and that we again see those packages are attached and, and listed in here, which is great. So this is a code chunk, and we'll see code chunks more when we move on to updating our R script. Another cool feature of R Markdown is the ability to put inline code. So you'll see um, here that I have R version 4.0.2, uh, but perhaps I'll update my version of R, and I would like to get uh, have this number updated, or if I update tidyverse or data table, that I'll update these other things, right? I also mentioned that I'd like to include in here our markdown, uh, but I don't know what version it is. I guess I could dig through it, but that's kind of tedious, right? I'd like to do this programmatically. What we can do is we can, we can make inline code. And so if I replace that line where I had R, I can put in single back ticks R, and this tells our markdown, run what's in these back ticks as code and then insert it as text. And so I can type r version dot string. And if I came down to my console here and did r version dot string, I would get this string as output. And so it would then insert r version string here, again, because it sees the back tick r. If I knit that, you'll see down here in my dependencies, I have r version 4.0.2, the same output I had here. We'd like to do the same thing here for tidyverse, data table, and R markdown. I can do that using the package version function, but I messed up here. I've got to put this in back ticks and I've got to include the R, so package version. And then as the argument to package version, I'm going to put the name of the package and I need to put that in quotes. So I'll do tidyverse in quotes and I'll copy this down and I will Instead of tidyverse, I'll put data table and R markdown. Now, if I save this, what we should get is in the parentheses and after the V, the version number for these three different packages. Let's see, what do we get? So we get 1.3, 1.13, 2.3 um, for our version of R markdown. And uh, that's pretty slick. 
I'm kind of surprised as I look through the R Markdown document that didn't yell at me. Um, and that's because these packages, I guess they're installed, but they're not quite loaded. And so what I'd like to do to, to be a little bit cleaner is to instead move these library calls up ahead. And I will make a code chunk to do that. Um, I'll do that up here before dependencies. So I'll do R and then the three back ticks, and I'll include those three library calls. Um, again, I was surprised it didn't complain because those uh, packages weren't loaded, but perhaps package version doesn't require the package to actually be uh, loaded with a library function for it to get that, um, to get that value. Um, I also, so I, I can move that message false back up to here. Um, and so I can name my code chunks after the R, but before the comma, I could put library uh, calls, right? To give my code chunk a name, I could call this session info, right? Um, these are pretty basic uh, names for these chunks, uh, but it does help to organize because you can see down here, RStudio is nice in that it uh, gives you the outline and structure of your document along with uh, the different code chunks that are in there. Makes it easier to navigate. Um, I also don't necessarily want to see that I've called the libraries, the library um, commands. What I can do to, so if I, let me just run this to see what it looks like. Knitting that. So I see these library calls. Again, message equals false was called as part of defining the code chunk, so I don't see all that output from tidyverse and data table. Um, I do see the good versions, and then I see session info is cleaner down here. What I'd like to do is, because I don't really want to see these library calls, what I could add is echo as an argument and say false. And what echo does is it will um, echo echoes the code. So if I say echo equals true, it shows the code. Echo equals true is the default. Echo, echo equals false uh, would, would turn that off. So if I go ahead and knit that and scroll down here in my document, I see that that library section has been uh, muted and uh, it runs the code, but it doesn't show the output. Uh, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't output the code itself, right? Uh, and we could do the same thing here to not show uh, session info. Maybe I'll go ahead and do that. So I can say echo equals false. Yeah. And again, scrolling to the bottom, I see all the output from session info, but I don't see the, the command call. I think it gives it a little bit nicer, cleaner look. It all depends on how transparent you want to be in showing people how you generated the output. And I think for this readme file, uh, what we've got here is, is perfect. And we'll go ahead and save this. Now, I'd like to keep this under control of my make file. And at the bottom here, at some point I should come through and organize things. I'm going to have readme.md as the target and readme.rmd as the dependency, obviously. And to run this, the, the recipe will be r hyphen e, and that hyphen e tells r run what follows from the command line. And we'll do it in quotes, so we'll do library um, r markdown, because we have to load that library before we run it. And then we want to do render, and we'll do readme um, dot rmd. Now, something that occurs to me as I do this is that I, I tend to use double quotes a lot, uh, but I've got double quotes nested inside double quotes. So what I probably want to use instead on the inside would be single quotes. Um, and so what this will do, do library R markdown and then render that. And if I go ahead and save this and I can then do make readme.md, it tells me it's up to date. So I need to force it. Uh, so maybe I'll uh, remove a line here, save it, and then run that. So it's going to run it and generate the, the files. And let me look at what has changed. And I see that I have this readme.md file and that it also generated um, this readme.html file, which it says is the preview file. 
I'd like to turn that off because I, I don't want to keep track of the HTML files as we go through. And what we can do is we can change this header. And this header is called YAML, Y-A-M-L. And I can then do preview underscore HTML equals false. Save that, and that should turn off the production of the HTML file. Run this again. So it's not happy. And I realized that I used preview HTML. And what I really want is HTML preview. Let's give this a shot. Great. That went through. That worked. Again, if I do ls lth, I can see that. Um, the HTML file is older than the markdown file, so it didn't get created. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Um, okay. And I'll go ahead, and that's all the changes I want to make to my readme file. So I'll go ahead and git add make file because we added that as a target. Readme md and readme rmd. Git commit, and then we'll say make readme a dynamic file and get checkout master get merge um, so it's complaining at me uh, yeah I so I it thinks I deleted the files or something or been moved so I want to close that um, and let's see we'll do get merge issue 21 and we see we've got these three. Um, I forgot to say that this closed issue 21. You know, those of you that have been around a while know that I do that frequently. Um, let me see if I can do git commit uh, amend. Oh. And then I'll say closes number 21. Get status, we're good. And I'll do git push. All right, and if I uh, might look at my issue 21, I did both of these things, I'll check them off. What's the point of having a checklist if you're not gonna check things out? All right, uh, so let me come back to code. And now if we look at my readme file, which is here actually, I see that I've got my updates and then I've got my output here. And so GitHub does some nice formatting for output of code. It gives it this kind of subtle gray background and we can scroll to the right if things go off the side of the page. I think this episode's gonna go a little bit longer than the past few episodes, but I think it's important to show the evolution of these R Markdown documents and get to a point where in the future when we do these types of exploratory data analyses, we can write them in R Markdown documents rather than as a kind of vanilla R script. Okay. So back here at my terminal, I'm gonna go ahead and create the issue for issue 20, the branch for issue 23. So I'll do git branch issue 22, git checkout issue 22, great. And you'll recall that if I do git status, the one thing we haven't tracked is this R script. What I'm gonna do before we go too much further is go ahead and rename this to be an R markdown document. So I'll do git move and then I'll change it from a .r to md file. And if I look, I'm gonna go ahead and open up both my readme file as well as my new um, R script, which isn't much of an R script. It's an R script in an R markdown document, I mean. Uh, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and copy this header and put that at the top of my, uh, my code here. I'm gonna change the date to the ninth and I'm gonna change the title to uh, analyzing the sensitivity for discriminating between genomes. Okay. That all can stay the same. And I'm going to go ahead and make an R uh, code chunk for my library. And I'm going to turn off messages. So that will generate. And so um, 
what I'm going to do is I had comments in here, and I'm going to turn those into narrative text as well as headers. And I'll, I'll use three pound signs to make it kind of a third level heading, not, not ginormous. And so we'll, we'll ask, uh, need to determine the number of Rn operons across genomes. And so we'll say our analysis will use full length sequences. And so we'll read this in. And so that's the code chunk we'll use to read uh, the full length. And, um, and so then what we'll say is, can we, um, we want to count and plot the number of copies Per genome. All right. We'll make that a code chunk. Again, we define the code chunk with these three back ticks and the curly braces for R. Maybe I'll give it a title of N R N. And then we'll close it with those three back ticks. Um, and I think that actually looks pretty good. And I'll go ahead and knit this and we'll see what the output looks like. Um, ah, and it tells us that this does not exist in our current working directory, um, which is exploratory. Now, if I go to my console and do get wd, we saw this before that we're in our project root directory, but unfortunately a quirk of our markdown is that it uses the directory that the file is in as the working directory. So to solve this, we need to use a package called here. And um, I'm gonna do library here. And one of the things I've noticed is if you put library here, here, <laughs> and you don't have here installed, you'll get a message across the top here saying, it's required for this script, do you want to install it? And so that's a really nice feature of RStudio. Of course, you could also come over here to packages on the lower right here and install it there as well. So that's great. And what here does is that here, the package will look for the rproj file in your project it will use that as the root for your project. And if you look at files, there's no uh, rproj file here. So if I go up a level, it says, ah, your rproj file is here in Schloss R and analysis. And so this is gonna be what it considers the root of the project. Now I can go ahead and wrap my, any of my paths with the here function. And if I run this, and knit, that error message will go away. Um, and what we'll see is that um, it ran library here, and then it reads this in, right? And so everything looks good to this point. Um, we see that uh, it's inserting markdown for the plot. Um, so maybe I'll turn that off so we can see what it looks like. But we see the type of output we had uh, before uh, from the last episode. Let me go ahead and turn off um, this HTML preview part and re-knit it so you can see what it looks like inside of the document. When it's rendered up on GitHub, um, it, it will show the plot. And so we can see the plot here as well in the output, which is great. Um, and I'll add some commentary. Uh, sometimes people will send me the output of their R Markdown documents, and it's just code, right? It's a wall of code and output. And it gives me no context of what's going on. I'd like to get some text in here to give me some interpretation. So we see that um, most genomes actually have more than one copy of the RRN operon. I wonder whether uh, those different copies are the same same sequence slash ASV, hmm. which is the next section, right? Uh, so um, determine number of ASVs per genome. And we'll say, considering uh, most genomes have multiple copies of the RN operon. We need to know whether they all uh, have the same 
ASV. Otherwise, we run the risk of splitting a single genome I'm going to just ignore my typos for now. A single genome into multiple uh, ASVs. Good. I can't ignore it. All right. So again, we're giving some text, some context to the results. And again, I'll use uh, my code chunks. You could name them if you want. I'm trying to kind of quickly go through this so we're not spending too much time watching me type and insert all sorts of crazy typos. Um, and what we found in running this Again, if we scroll down, was that uh, that's the operons that we found that the number of ASVs actually increases at a rate of about two ASVs per three um, RRN copies. So surprisingly, or not, <laughs> uh, the number of ASVs increases at a rate of about two ASVs per three copies of RN operon in the genome. Right. Again, it gives us some context and some interpretation of the data. The next question we were interested in was um, determine whether an ASV is unique to genomes they are found in, right? So we might have multiple ASVs per genome, but are those ASVs found across genomes, right? Are they specific to uh, those genomes? All right, and so instead of looking at the number of ASVs per genome, we want to see uh, the number of genomes per ASV, right? So we're going to flip the question, if you will. Uh, add that R. Uh, it's really nice that RStudio throws in uh, spell checking for us. And what you'll recall from last time this number sticks out is that we see that with full length sequences, the number of um, genomes that an ASV, that, that I think is 82% of the ASVs were unique to a genome. Okay. Now, this number 82 kind of bugs me um, from like an aesthetic perspective. Uh, we won't do this here, but in future episodes, what we could do is replace that 82 with actual R code to calculate the value from uh, this code chunk. And, um, and that's, that turns out to be really nice, say, when we're writing papers, or if the data changes, we don't have to worry about updating every single number. And again, if we look at the output here down towards the bottom, um, we again see 0.824, and our text is there. Okay. So we'll then say, do the, does the sensitivity, sensitivity, uh, and specificity change if we at a shorter region. So um, we suspect or we know that the V4 region is actually less diverse than the full length sequence. So does the number of ASVs per genome uh, differ than for full length? And does um, our ASVs as specific uh, when using the V4 region compared to full length sequences. Okay, so those are two questions. And so we'll take on this first one in this first uh, code block that was much like what we had before. And so what we find is that 
uh, the number of ASVs per copy of RRN operon is lower than for full length. Um, we find well 1.5 ASV per um, copy of um, the RN operon. Okay. Let me just double check that's right. Again, we could insert codes. So we don't have to worry about, you know, are we getting the right value? So rendering this, ah, we get the same problem again where it can't find the file. So I forgot to wrap my, my path in here. That here function is really slick. Um, I'm really grateful for it. Uh, if you didn't use here, you'd have to use these dot dot forward slash and uh, the, the relative paths would just get really, really messy. All right, so if we scroll down to the bottom, we find that, um, let's see. Um, yeah, so, was it one and a half? I guess it was like one and a half per 10, right? Um, 15 to, yeah, so maybe uh, per 10 copies of the RN Operon. Great, so we can update that. Again, it would be much better to insert the code to calculate those numbers, but that would get us deeper into R than I really wanna to go today. So next, let's look at the specificity of an ASV for a genome. We'll create that code chunk, output that. And I believe what we found was that it was about 76% of the ASVs were unique to, um, to a genome. And so, yeah, so we found that 76% of the ASVs were only found in one genome. All right, so um, that about at the V4, okay. Now we talked about a few things in the last episode that we could do with this. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this as like to be uh, determined. So uh, can, we, can, can we correct for over-representation? We might do this by um, consider analysis at species, genus, family, ETC levels. So instead of looking at the genome level, which isn't really the level that I think even like the hardcore proponents of Amplicon sequence variants claim, um, they think it's more at like a species level. Um, we might also consider looking at a uh, broad, more broad, definition of an ASV. So what we've done here is really exact sequence variants, but again, even the hardcore proponents of ASVs um, or ESVs um, aren't really looking at exact sequence variants. They allow a little bit of slop in their definition of an ASV. So these might be things we do in the future. So I'll go ahead and save that and knit it. And this then results in our final document as we have it. And so again, what's really nice is that we've integrated text and code to give a pretty pleasant output of what we're doing. And you could take the HTML file, share it with your advisor or with your collaborator, um, and they can see the code, they can see what you're doing. But for my purposes, I'm gonna put this up on GitHub. And so I'm gonna say HTML preview false and save this. And what I'm gonna now do is put this into my make file. And let me get my uh, paths. That's the, the RMD file. And the output of this will be an MD file. So that's one dependency, that RMD file. The other dependency is gonna be data v19 rndb count tibble, as well as data v4 
map tibble. And we're going to largely do the same thing we did above here. Um, again, remember that we need tabs here. So maybe I'll put another tab in to make it clear that that's not the recipe. And I'm going to replace readme.rmd with the name of my readme, my rmd file. Um, so that looks good. And I can now do, if I've saved this, and I've saved my our markdown document. Yep, that's saved. I can then do make that. And it complains. Why is it complaining? All right. Let me see if I've got, yeah, I've got a tab there. I think the YAML prefers spaces. Is that the problem? Yeah. So sometimes when you're copying and pasting, tabs get inserted instead of spaces. This looks good. Um, it creates our output, um, sendspec.md. And indeed, if I do get status, I'll see that I've got um, an RMD file, the output MD file. I don't have the HTML file, which is good. And then I've got a new directory that actually has the images that are being generated uh, through this for the plots. So let me show you what that looks like. So ls that, and I see that there's a figure here, gfm. Um, and that's a, that's a directory also. And so you'll see that there's three directories in here. And if I had named my code chunk, then you'll see that we would give um, um, the, the, the PNG files, these image files, would have those names. But big deal. Uh, if I go to Atom and I look at my exploratory file, the MD file, with the markdown packages installed, I can do Control Shift M. And sometimes it gives this error, but if I hit Control Shift M again, <laughs> um, it will then um, give me a representation of what the output looks like, right? So this is largely what it will look like on GitHub, uh, which is pretty slick. Uh, Control W to close that window. And I'm gonna go ahead and commit all this stuff. So I will do git add make file and then exploratory and then 2020.09. And I'm gonna put a star at the end of that line to commit all three of these uh, files and directories. Get status. I see my um, various files, the new files, as well as the modified make file. And I can do git commit dash m, and I can say um, convert R script to rmd to view on GitHub. Closes number 22. Git checkout master. And then merge the issue and git push. And if this worked, again, I'm getting this complaint. I don't want to, uh, yeah, I'll close that file. Um, I'll look at um, and see that it's closed my issue. And if I come back to code, exploratory, and then my MD file, I see it's rendered with images in tow um, as, as we saw it from our studio, which is pretty slick. Again, we've got the code, we've got the context, we've got the output. This is just really wonderful and ultimately leads to a much more reproducible analysis where you can see the code that was used to generate the data. Um, if I update the data, all this will also get updated because it's under control of my make file. All right. So this is where I want to stop us for the day, um, for today's episode. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I know this one went a little bit longer uh, than the previous episodes. I've been trying to keep them short, uh, but there's just so much good stuff. And this is such a powerful tool using our markdown. I've really been eager to share it with you. If you like this content and you wanna see where we take this going forward, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, click on the bell, to like it so you know, you're know knowing you know uh, when the next episode is released, um, probably in a couple days. Also, please tell your friends about what we're doing here on Code Club. Um, I'd love to get more people involved. I'd love to get more input. So please leave a comment below if you've got any questions. I'd really encourage you to think about, could you create an R Markdown document using what I've shown you already today uh, to generate a figure from your latest paper? Um, I think that would be a really powerful and compelling 
use case to see why you might want to use R Markdown. So give that a shot. If you run into any problems, feel free to let me know. And we'll see if we can work through them together. Until next time, keep practicing, and we'll see you for another episode of Code Club.